Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are just waiting for all the people to stream in. So just give us a few more minutes um, because we have something very exciting to share with everybody as uh, soon as most of you get in. So stay riveted. We'll be with you in a few minutes. As the sun rises, this extraordinary park comes to life. The sea, the rivers and the mangroves makes this one of the most biodiverse parks in Singapore. That gave me goosebumps. Hello, I am Debbie Ng. Thank you for joining Conversations with the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. And you just watched an excerpt from the short film, Residents of the Park, shot right here in, believe it or not, Singapore City. This film has received over 64,000 views on YouTube. And our team here at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions was so inspired by the short film that we decided to adapt our ongoing seminar series into a panel discussion where we can talk about living with nature. Have you seen this film? What did you think? We would love for you to weigh in and join today's conversation. You can send your questions in on Facebook or Twitter or directly into the chat here on Zoom. Before today's discussion, I asked renowned primatologist and conservationist, Dr. Andy Ang, what a city in nature means to her. So let's just take a listen to what she had to say. We need to learn how to behave when we encounter wild animals, to respect them and to give them space. And most importantly, we need to understand our biodiversity, our natural heritage, so that we can better appreciate what we have, the threats that they face, and how to protect them. This is why I think nature education is so crucial and it needs to start early. So our guests, from a garden city to a city in nature, Singapore has long recognized the importance of maintaining green landscapes in our city for livability, social cohesion, and increasingly for environmental benefits such as enhancing our air quality, reducing urban heat, and even safeguarding native wildlife. But as our demands for nature has grown, so too has our urban environment. Here to discuss the nature of nature and what we would have to do to thrive in a livable city with wildlife, we have filmmakers and storytellers, Jaya Prakash Bojan and Dan Ng. From the Asian School of the Environment, Dr. Sean Lam and Dr. Perrin Hamill, and from the School of Design and Environment at the National University of Singapore, we have Dr. Huang yun -hei, a very highly qualified panel, but let's get to know them a little bit better, starting with Dan and Jaya Prakash. Please tell our audience who you are and what you do. Let's start with you, Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan, and I'm a freelance artist. I do illustrations, photography, and videography for a living. And the best part of it is that I enjoy what I do. It's like my passion. So it's like I'm not even working a day in my life. 
Jai Prakash, tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Jai Prakash Bojan. I'm a nature wildlife conservation photographer and documentary filmmaker. And uh, this is what I do for a living. <laughs> Wonderful. Dr. Sean Lam, so glad for you to join us. What does our audience have to know about you? Uh, maybe the less the better. I don't know, Debbie, but uh, I, I teach ecology at the NTU Asian School of the Environment, and I also volunteer in, in uh, uh, civil society, most, mostly with the Nature Society. But it's uh, wonderful to be here and, and see, if, see so many friends. Glad to have you with us. Hello, Dr. Huang. Very glad you can join us this morning. Tell us who you are and what you do. Yes, my name is Yunhe. Um, I'm the landscape architect. And also I'm leading the Bachelor of the Landscape Architecture program under the uh, this, uh, Department of Architecture in um, School of Design and Environment in NUS. Uh, the urban ecology is a kind of fundamental framework for my design and uh, teaching and research. Uh, I'm more uh, focused on the, this high dense uh, urbanized uh, city, like tropical city like Singapore. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Huang and Dr. Hamel. Thank you for joining us today. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm a faculty at the Asian School of the Environment at NTU. Uh, I also live on NTU campus, which is a nice way to discover Singapore and hornbills, wild boars and uh, macaques, uh, all the wildlife that we get to interact with here. Um, and my research and teaching focus on uh, what we call ecosystem services, um, which is a fancy way of saying that I study all the benefits that uh, nature provides to us, uh, whether it is urban cooling, flood mitigation, as well as less tangible benefits for our well-being. Fantastic. All very exciting and very important and diverse panel. Um, I would like to hear from all of our guests just very briefly how do we think we are doing in Singapore in terms of creating a city in nature today, right now? Or perhaps you think we are already in a city in nature. What are your thoughts? Dan, could we please start with you? What do you think? I think we are already kind of like a city in nature. I mean, we have so much greenery everywhere, especially on our roads and the expressway. Like, I travel quite a fair bit and Overseas is really different, you know, when you're on the roads, it's just like roads and nothing else. It's just like a city. It's all man-made. But in Singapore, it's like, you're kind of like shrouded in greenery, you know. Everywhere you look, it's just green. So I would say like, we're doing a pretty decent job. Amazing job, actually. Yeah. Jai Prakash, tell us what you think. Are we in a city in nature? Or what do we have to do to get there? Well, I think... I think we are, we are almost there under the current circumstances um, with our population density and uh, considering the limited landmass we have, I think we have already done an uh, incredibly good job. Um, can we do better? Yes, definitely we could do better. Dr. Hamla, I see you smiling there. Tell us what you're smiling about. All right, I'll, I'll, no, not, not to smile then and <laughs> be put on the spot. <laughs> um, no, I, I think I was smiling because I agree, um, especially with the we getting there. I think that would be my uh, my answer, my simple answer. Um, a lot of really, really good things uh, being done in Singapore. Um, and again, I moved here uh, a bit more than a year ago, so I'm very new to understanding the various uh, pieces of the puzzle that would make a city in nature. Um, perhaps just to um, get us um, one step further in that conversation, I can share one of the frameworks that I like using to, to think about um, urban nature, which is called the Urban Nature Futures Framework. Um, and that really invites us to think about different positive uh, futures for nature. Um, and it, it invites us to, to think about not everyone in this room uh, or in, in Singapore thinks about nature the same way. Um, some of us perhaps think about nature for the sake of nature. We need to protect nature because it has value intrinsically, uh, which I think is a very valid reason to, to protect nature. Some of us may think about all the ecosystem services I was talking about. Um, and so this would be more of a nature for people um, kind of perspective where 
we protect nature because it's actually a way of protecting us. So very um, anthropocentric uh, way of thinking about nature. Um, and the third dimension in this framework that I'm talking about is nature as culture, um, which I think gets closer to this idea of city in nature, where it's about all of us really thinking about our relationship with nature, kind of an everyday relationship, which I think the movie is actually doing a, a really good job at getting at this realization that we are part of nature um, and that it's part of our everyday life. Definitely lots of diverse um, ways to look at nature. Dr. Huang, what is your perspective on nature? What does it mean to you? Well, um, I, I think well, it's, uh, it's really agree that point that we are already there in the city in nature. And so this initiative of, of the government just recently did it also. It, it really, really uh, helping pushing forward the more variety of the nature and also the more uh, connect with the quality. And so but again, it's a green space is not, not all same. So <clears throat> probably in the the success of the, this initiative, like a uh, city in God nature, uh, can be more uh, further up. So probably today we all going to be saying about something how we can go further. So especially for the, the appreciation of the, this film that about the, this uh, how to close to the nature and how to interact more. Uh, uh, variety way to make uh, promote the, this uh, wildlife and nature interaction. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, this discussion, yeah. Getting close to nature, I think Sean Lam, you know all about that. Tell us what is your uh, feeling of a city and nature and what nature is to you? Yeah, thanks, thanks uh, Debbie. I mean, I don't get as close to it as Dan and Jaya Prakash, of course, <laughs> I mean, but, uh, um, and, I, and I thought you were gonna play more than that video. I was like, why'd you stop it? Why'd you stop it? You know, but um, I, I think, the city in nature is, 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 the, is not just, it just didn't happen spontaneously. I mean, of course, nature has to be there, but a lot of work and planning uh, goes into it. And I, I think like the, everyone was saying, you know, like Perrine was saying, can, can we make it a way of life? Can we feel the same affection for all these amazing creatures that, that Jaya and Dan so lovingly depicted on the film? elevate that on the same pedestal as we might say laksa or hokkien mi or something like that and really make it part of our being and then how can we take that and then don't let it stop there but then actually sort of transform the, the wider world around us you know because there are these 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 this urgent uh, moment in our history that we're a uh, crisis that we're living through and can we translate this love that we're quickly developing for nature into something bigger for the benefit of you know everyone that that's uh, a small matter but yeah we can <laughs> talk about that this morning so wildlife like laksa i guess it's like natural national natural heritage you know how how do we get people to push for that we have pe people pushing for buildings um for food maybe someone will rise up to the occasion and push for wildlife to be recognized as part of our heritage as well and to have that protected. Um, Daya and Dan, I think you have a, a big uh, a, a role to play in all of us feeling empathy for nature. You have spent a lot of time outdoors, intimately documenting nature as uh, Dr. Lam has just mentioned. I'm really curious what have you observed about how we interact with nature? How, how have you seen people behave um, outdoors with nature? Well, I think, I think we have mixed feelings about it. I think there's um, tremendous potential and scope for us to do a lot more um, education around what we have, what we don't have, um, how do we behave, uh, and things like that. Um, but in general, I think uh, having spent a lot of time more on inside the inside the inside the park, we spent very little time inside the reserves, obviously because uh, you know um, it's all protected area and stuff like that. But uh, the community is there. I think there are there, there are a lot of people who who showing keen interest in what we're doing, what we're seeing. Uh, one of my biggest challenges has been to uh, obviously, if you look at uh, audience mix in our country. Um, usually videos like these or all the documentaries we do uh, only reaches a certain audience 
um, and usually it only reaches the already educated audience. So um, for me and Dan, we've been constantly debating, you know, how how can we how can we take it down to uh, maybe as simple as people there having food in the hawker centers. Um, maybe not all of maybe not everybody even understands uh, the the English language that we spoke in the the video. We were thinking maybe we should do a, a Chinese translation, maybe to take it a Malay translation or a Tamil translation to see if we can take a larger audience. Uh, but I think in general, uh, there is tremendous scope on um, how we can, uh, you know, help help people uh, become a little more knowledgeable about what we have, what we don't have, and uh, more importantly, the amazing stuff we we have here. What about you, Dan? What what have your thoughts been of uh, watching how people have been interacting with people? Uh, people have been interacting with nature uh, in our in our urban parks. I think so far, like people are going there in the parks and they are enjoying it. But maybe <clears throat> they could have a little bit more interest in um, understanding the surroundings and knowing what's around them. Because I think for myself. I mean, six months ago, before I did this, I was kind of like everyone. I just took everything for granted. Like we have a beautiful park and everything, and I just go go to the like Pasiris Park, for example. I go there almost every day to rollerblade and jog and exercise. But I never actually knew that we had so much biodiversity down there and so much wildlife until I took the time to to understand the area and get interested and start, you know, enjoying what I see. So, I think. What we Jaya and I are doing now is to try and help people get interested by helping them fall in love with nature. So that's really kind of our vision and goal, so that you know they'll start caring a little bit more. But I guess pretty much everyone is enjoying nature, but I guess it's not enough. You know, you gotta start like being present in the moment. And and how did that happen for you? So you were there, and all of this was in the background for you, and then something happened, and you decided to pay more attention. What was that that happened? Mm, I guess like I've always wanted to do wildlife photography, but I always had this idea in my back of my head, like you know, there's not really much wildlife in Singapore. I guess like I thought like everyone else, so I kind of took it all for granted until I actually slowed down and and thought to myself like, what if there's actually wildlife in Singapore? If I just you know take the time to search and look for them, and then I just realized like, oh my god, it's actually all around us. Just that we're we're just not really looking, you know. We're not really appreciating what we have, and we're it's just all going by. We're just going with the flow. So, I think being present with the moment really helps you slow down and appreciate everything around you. And I guess like with COVID happening, I really appreciate what I have in Singapore. Like I'm really proud to call this my home. Like we are so sheltered. Everything is like built to, for us and made for us for our convenience sake. So, I think something just really shifted in my mindset you know like in the past six months i it's it's really different i don't really know how to explain it but i just feel it you know it's amazing on that note i would like to ask our audience if their views and experience of nature places in singapore has changed over COVID as well we'd like to hear more from your thoughts about how this uh, pandemic might have changed your views and the ways you interact with um our urban park so please leave your uh, questions for us in Twitter and Facebook or here directly on Zoom. Uh, Dr. Lam, you have spent an incredible amount of time studying and advocating for Singapore forests. How do you see films like this play a role in the conservation conversation? Oh, I mean, I, I think, uh... You can do all the research. I mean, research obviously that's the so the, the bedrock of of how we you know understand nature. How do we design policy? How do we do do a lot of planning? But ultimately, that 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 appeals to maybe a a, a certain co community. And I think something that's visual that really hits you in the hits you viscerally and, and straight at your heart. Um, I think that moves people. And I, unless unless we have Again, I think a few few people were saying already. Dan, Jaya, Karine. I mean, if if we don't have, if nature doesn't mean something to us, uh, either you know, in an emotional or spiritual or some deeper way than just kind of in our in our head, then then I think um, 
not only does that give nature less of a secure future, but I think it robs us of something very beautiful and enriching and wonderful. I mean, imagine the Pasi Ris is you walk from the MRT five minutes, you're where with the guys were taking the videos. I mean, that's un unbelievable. And, and yet if, if more people just realize that, imagine how much more meaningful it would be to all of us to say, wow, you know, did you know that this stuff is here? So I, I think th these are absolutely important. And then, but then it's up to the rest of us now to help and sort of build other things around that to kind of take that impact and then do something positive with it. On that note, I would like to share this article published on Channel News Asia. Um, just give me a second to do that. Share screen. Here it is. Thank you for your patience. So here, uh, writer Erin Lowe um, decides to venture out into the wilderness of Singapore. And after a hundred meters, she says to herself, I wish I tried harder. Maybe it's just me. Maybe Singaporeans love the idea of being in nature, but most people probably like the idea more than actually being in nature. Um, I would like to ask, you know, Dr. Huang, you've been working on bringing a little bit of bringing wild places into urban spaces. What do you think, why is nature so challenging for some of us? Is it necessary that we have to have a hard time in nature to get close to it? What are some of the things you're doing to make it um, a little bit more wild here in very manicured Singapore city? Well, um, well, as a designer, I think it's uh, we have some critical role that how to make uh, this one to be more uh, aesthetically uh, all right and also maybe more pleasing uh, kind of environment. So mm -hmm. I think, well, I agree that the publicity is important and education is important. So how to make people to be exposure to the, this uh, wildlife in a more uh, uh, kind of comfortable manner and uh, uh, so I think this is this is one of the things what I'm I'm working on it with the design so uh, one of the uh, uh, idea is that um, we also need a somehow uh, dis distance but again we also need to be connected so it's a kind of visualizing and also the making exposure to the people like filming and also the this uh, uh, all the photos or the publicity is really really important uh, and, and at the same time like how to make a, a, a like more uh, grant the, this uh, uh, wildlife in a part of the, our everyday life so it means that I need a somehow idea like this idea to how to make them to be closer but not to interrupt each other. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm working on the, this part through the, my uh, design studio and also the research space work that, uh, uh, so doing it is, so yeah, that, that's one thing. But but there are many, many examples anyway. So we already done in uh, a Singapore case that uh, it's, if we like uh, promote all the, this naturalized uh, canal, I mean, natural waterway and also the older garden that to incorporate with the, some of the area, they're not really touching it, uh, but the, uh, can be exposure to the people to be not accessible, but can be seen, can, can see. So probably there are many, many way to using it. So um, we just need a, a more clever idea how to make this one to be uh, coexist each other by using the, this all the design as a tool to make them to be uh, uh, in, incorporated and uh, living together. So yeah. You mentioned the changing of the landscape um, to incorporate things like naturalized canals um, for aesthetics, for biodiversity, but also increasingly we're looking at changing our landscape to use, to learn from nature, right? To mimic how nature has been resilient to natural disasters in the past. Dr. Hamel, would you like to tell us a little bit about what we can do as a city to create spaces that the, allow the provision of these services? And why are they important for our city and nature? 
Yes, um, that's, a, that's a good point and something that all around the world is getting and gaining attention. Um, Singapore has been uh, really among the pioneering cities uh, for the ABC Waters um, program, for example, uh, also known as water sensitive urban design. Uh, and I think this gets to uh, at some of these examples of using nature, uh, using vegetated systems to manage our stormwater in, in, in cities which will help reduce flood risk in, in that case, also reduce um, water pollution, etc. So uh, these are good examples. Um, another area that's gaining a lot of attention is using these nature-based solutions for urban cooling, uh, because shade and evapotranspiration will also help reduce uh, temperature in our cities, which is quite important for uh, tropical cities and a lot of cities all around the world. Um, so yes, definitely Singapore is uh, looking at these solutions and uh, I would say more and more uh, with uh, some of these elements being in the Singapore Green Plan, for example, um, and really continuing some really good research and implementation over the, the past uh, few years. And what do you think, uh, Dan and uh, Jaya Prakash? We've just heard some, you know, quite far away views from uh, just looking at wildlife in our parks. Do you think films um, like yours could sort of reach out to people to see nature in some of these different ways? How do you connect with some of the arguments we've just heard about the value of um, need natural services in our city? Well, I know, uh, you know, for example, Dr. Yun has a very tough job. Uh, I know she very simply explained it, but it's easier said than done, uh, especially considering uh, if you're only looking at our island city state, right? Um, it's, it's probably super complicated. Uh, on one hand, I think we want to protect uh, wildlife, protect biodiversity. So sometimes, I'm arguing with myself all the time. Sometimes I tell myself, maybe we should just cut these places completely off any human interaction, you know, and just, just completely leave them alone. On the other hand, I'm like, how would people even appreciate what is there if they don't get to see or if they don't get to experience? So I think the challenge has been to kind of figure out a way to have a really fine balance between the idea of uh, exploring wildlife, idea of uh, being out there in the wild, but at the same time, um, ensuring that we don't destroy what's left of our biodiversity. So, well, I think balance, balance is the key. Uh, it's, it's literally impossible to stop development in our country, right? I mean, that's, that's a given. So, On that note, I have a question here from Chi Yung Kwan. I hope I've said that name right. Um, the question is, part of the culture we need to include in Singapore is to have more literature based on local fauna and flora, plus proper outdoor immersive sports education. I'd like to ask our panelists, what do you think? Uh, perhaps Sean, you'd like to chime in on that. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, again, I think we're, we're you know, we, we've, we're many, we're five, almost six million people. We've got many different views. And I think, you know, for, for many, um, a, a different way we do outdoor education would be important for others having more information to, to be able to access and understand what we're looking at. All of those things are very important. I also feel though, I mean, I watch a documentary with two, made by two very experienced, like we're talking Nat Geo photographer of the year, you know, level of expertise. And if I go out and go to Pasiris and I don't see anything, the chances are I might come away very disappointed if I if I wasn't experienced enough. Part of, I think for all of us, the, part of the fun of going out to nature is there's this unpredictability. It's not like Disneyland, you go and everything's there. You go, some days you see, some days you see nothing, but seeing nothing is also rewarding. You're out there, you're thinking, uh, you, uh, not just about the animal or you're looking for, but your, your place in nature is very, it's, it, it's a quiet moment too. I think that's part of the beauty. And I'm looking at that orang utan behind the background of Jaya Prakash and thinking, you know, I, I may never live to see a wild 
orangutan. I may ne never go to those peat swamps in Borneo, but knowing that it's there and these magnificent swamps that are there makes me feel, it, it gives me great pleasure to know that it's there in the same way that if, if say a great museum were to suffer a fire or something, I would feel like there was a loss for me personally. And I, I think that's, I think that's the power really of, 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 okay, so we have the material, we learn, we put it in our head, but then we feel it in our heart also. And then we, and then it, it, it will really transform the way we see the world and the added benefits are that it's, it's good for us. It provides services and everything. I mean, it's every, it's a link to our culture. Yeah. I think these are very powerful things and it just starts with um, getting in that right frame of mind to, to um, appreciate, to appreciate and feel the, awe and wonder of, of, of what nature um, has uh, all around us. Yeah, so I'm hearing facilitation is very important. What do we expect when we go to these places? How do we manage our expectations? How do we learn from the experiences? How do we find joy even in, in going to a park and not seeing an animal? How do we enjoy moments of disappointment and get around that and still enjoy the, 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 the park uh, for all the beauty that it is? Um, and I think films like the ones that Dan and Jai Prakash <clears throat> have done um, definitely are important in facilitating. We have another qu question here from Carl Pum. Do the points listed in the recent Green Party plan, excuse me, I'm gonna have a sip of water. <clears throat> Do the points listed in the Green Plan truly highlight a city in nature or are there important things we missed out from it? Now, before we um, give the panel an opportunity to respond to that question, I think it's a good time to share a video from Anbarasi Bhupal, who is the co-CEO uh, of the Animal Concerns Research and Education Society. So here we go. So many of us may be aware of um, a lot of sightings of wild boars that has happened recently in Pongo. And I just want to highlight that such incidents is really a consequence of intensive development in the past decade. So some of the projects or developers may have certain measures such as shepherding the wild animals, but this is not sufficient in the bigger picture. Shepherding and measures may be sufficient only within a site. Forest that is once lost is always uh, just lost. So the animals will get displaced. So wherever they are shepherded to, it might not be enough to sustain a bigger population. Then it will result in spillovers, becoming road kills or human wildlife conflict situations. So all this actually highlights the urgent need for a national action or a national strategy plan for wild animals and address where do these animals fall in the city in nature concept. We need to move away from reactive strategies to proactive measures that are put in place right before the urban planning and land use decided itself. So this would mean uh, engagement with nature groups, uh, which uh, every nature group comes in with their own expertise and has a lot of valuable contribution to offer in different areas. So we can have a proper city in nature, which is also safe for humans, animals, and the habitats at the same time. Yunhei, I saw you uh, nodding there. Um, would you like to articulate your, your thoughts on this and uh, points that you may have on whether you think the green plan uh, highlights the city in nature or if there are things that are missing? And perhaps after that, uh, Sean Nam, you could uh, share with us your thoughts. So yes, uh, I think I really agree to this point that um, we need a more regional scale um, uh, planning and regional scale think. So thought so the it, like uh, where well, the Singapore is very small but still again it's a it's, it's a kind of big island to see that what's the movement of the uh, what animal and so the what's the kind of larger scale strategic planning can helping this to determine that where is it like really uh, intensify the uh, land development and also intensify the where is a like area that to get helping a more wildlife to be uh, flourish. So what are the, like my question, big question is what are the 
green space that we must defend at all costs. So it, it is not probably it's connected with the economic aspect, it connect with the other uh, other purpose and other social demand too. But again, it's uh, uh, probably we need a more like larger scale to see that uh, where is a priority that do we need to keep it uh, because of the certain reason in terms of the wildlife movement and also network point of view. So probably Sean also have a more more idea of the, these things too. But we talk, we, we work over these things together. Um, the uh, more uh, research uh, kind of research based, uh, um, the understanding is that what's the actually the size that which is optimal for accommodate certain number or certain level of the wildlife. So this is one thing that uh, we also working on together. So uh, that's kind of larger scale we may need to uh, uh, see more. Uh, and uh, maybe go back to the discourse uh, question about that, whether we, we, we are really doing something uh, well or are there any important things we miss out? Yes, uh, as, I, as I already say at the beginning, probably a more, we more need a, like a quality of the green space we need to uh, think. So beyond this like a uh, government plan that having a, like a larger quantity of the tree planting and uh, making a double size of the old the park and something. So uh, probably there are many, many uh, ideas which we need to do it. So uh, one thing is about the, this larger scale strategic planning is one thing that uh, we need to work on it. And then the other maybe is in the district scale. So when we develop the uh, area, if we are not habitable to, I mean, we are not, not, not able to keep it. So the existing nature is inevitable to remove then what's the alternative to uh, uh, make a more intensify of the quality of the remaining green space? So, I mean, this is also very important. So again, we don't want to make them to be isolated, probably need a more uh, uh, kind of the uh, way to connect with the nearby area. And also probably need a more optimal use, like what uh, Perlin said is about the ecosystem service that we may accumulate all the, this multifunctionality as much as possible. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of things we can do it. So I, I'm excited to <laughs> say something about this and also the working on this. And so, and also probably need to be more uh, clearly identified what's the nature heritage, not just about the current one, it's more about the future nature heritage. So I can see that it's appreciation of the, this filming by the Dan and the Jabbers is that what I can see is that it's uh, really about to highlight the what's the future nature heritage. So uh, I think this is, this is one thing that I want to say to this, yeah. Sean, go I mean, I, yeah, no, I think everybody would have something um, uh, uh, quite substan substantial to say about this. But um, you know, you, I think the green plan is great. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a way forward, and and, and it sort of highlights it, it shrines this in, in policy. Others might argue, well, we should have been doing this all along. I mean, given the scale of this uh, climate and biodiversity crisis, it's it's not like we just woke up this morning and said, oh, we got a problem. It's we've known this for a long time. But but it, it's it, but that's not to say that the green plan is not it's fantastic. But you would think now it's just the start, a and it it should really lead to not just a physical transformation. I, and I really mean this not not just physical transformation of the way we build the city and the way we you know our processes and so on. There really has to be a transformation from from inside. You know, imagine we, we go off from this. Uh, uh, seminar and they would say, oh, I'm hungry. I think I'm going to go eat some bluefin tuna sushi. I haven't had it for a long time or eat some unagi, you know, or, uh, or uh, I'm buying something that actually has cleared, led to the clearing of this peat swamp behind where this orang utan is living. Then, then we haven't made the connection. And I, and I think, so for me, that's, that's ultimately where that green plan is going to make a difference. Does it make us think differently and do things differently? Because we feel that this is important to us, not not just not just for us now, but for, for everyone everywhere. Dr. Hamel, what do you think? And I'd also like to hear what you um, what your your research has has shown that are the real strengths of Singapore 
to to capitalize on this um, um, ecosystem functions in a in an urban environment. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, uh, actually three points that I wanted to make related to Yuni's and, and Sean's uh, comments. Um, so first, uh, on the green plan, um, I agree that there are already a lot of good things um, in, in terms of these uh, ecosystem services or, or nature for people uh, objective, as well as um, nature for nature. Uh, so that's good on the quantity of, of green spaces, in a sense. Quality is extremely important as well, you uh, underline that. Um, and I would like to say that use of these green spaces is also important. So not only reaching the outdoor enthusiasts, but really reaching to more broadly to the, the whole population in Singapore, um, enjoying these spaces and enjoying the benefits of, of these green spaces. So some equity part as well that, it, that is really important to, to remember when implementing this green plan. So it's in principle a lot of good things, but it really depends on how we as a nation uh, implement it. Um, the second point I wanted to make relate, related to this is that um, I understand that it's actually a good thing that a lot of agencies are behind this plan, which is relatively new as well, that it's not only end parks pushing this agenda, for example. Um, so hopefully that's a, a good sign that this is actually going to, to make a difference in, in practice. The third point I wanted to, to highlight, perhaps going back to your question, Debbie, about like having a hard time in nature being needed to, to really care about nature. I definitely don't think that's the case. Um, uh, obviously, the, there's a lot of research showing that um, even the, the more day-to-day -day interactions with the very simple things, insects uh, in, in nature, really helps um, children as well as adults become stewards of, of their nature. Um, and that's really important to care about your local nature as well as biodiversity uh, issues globally. Uh, Sean gave really good examples about caring about this orangutan. Uh, we know there's a global biodiversity crisis. Um, and so these connections of like reconnecting with your local nature as a way to become more aware of these connections uh, and then really trying to make a difference uh, beyond your own city or neighborhood park are extremely important. Yes, and I think another thing that uh, Sean brought up was the connection with the food that we eat as well. Um, there is a, a fantastic nature blogger in Singapore, Ivan Kwan, and he for a long time uh, was trying to help us make that connection by running this Instagram called Monday Morgue, where he took pictures of dead animals. It was a little bit morbid, but it was trying to show uh, the connection between the animals that we eat and where they come from and what they look like uh, before they end up on the dinner plate. Um, so every time you, you take a, a tasty bite, um, it's, a, it's a useful opportunity to reflect on the, the origins of that uh, little piece of energy. Um, on that note, uh, Dr. Hamel, we do have a question here from Fyral Sheik via Zoom. How do we manage um, perceived concerns of ecosystem disservices associated with introducing more nature in cities. For example, tree falls are resulting in, um, sorry, trees resulting in more roosting birds uh, or nuisance, nuisance uh, animals like rats or mosquitoes and associated um, diseases like dengue. How do we reconcile that? Um, yes, that is a very good question as well. Um, these services are also part of this framework of thinking about benefits and disbenefits. Um, I think the answer goes back to what many other speakers have pointed out today, that if you care and understand a bit more your relationship with nature, um, I think you, it makes you more ready to accept some of these disservices. Uh, it's not a direct conflict and, uh, and kind of knee-jerk reaction to, oh, these uh, macaques are very dangerous and, and I don't want uh, them on near my house, um, these mosquitoes, etc. But understanding that they are part of, a, of an ecosystem and, um, and that we're not controlling everything. So it's, it's again, I would say, uh, about reconnecting with, uh, with nature. 
perhaps you can, if I can quote one of the sentences that I really liked from the, the film, um, I think there's uh, something about rain, like all of the forces of nature is a reminder that we're all part of the natural world that's beyond our ability to control. Uh, and I feel like this is a really powerful way of, of describing this, that we can't control everything. Um, and, and I think it should make, make us humble uh, and, and really help us accept some of these disservices that we're not controlling and making everything benefits us humans. And if, I, if I could just quickly add, Debbie, about this disservice, I, I, I typed it into the chat thing, but you know, some of these are, are real problems, branches breaking, vector-borne disease. I mean, th these are these these are, are, are real issues. They need to be dealt with through planning, management, and hopefully in an ecologically friendly way. Other things, though, are, are issues of perception to some extent. I'm not trying to poo-poo anything, but take, for example, that COEL, which so many of us, whoo, you know, five in the morning, oh, God, shut that thing up. You know, people, a lot of people don't like it, but in other cultures, that's actually considered something like this blessing from nature, like a, a good omen. So I think in that case, it's how do, you know, what is re what are real problems and what are things that we could, are, are, are linked to maybe some, some values or perceptions. And I think distinguishing those and then managing um, those appropriately and sensitively, you know, because you have to respect that people, not everybody loves nature, at least not yet. And, and, and I mean, I think that's the challenge going forward. Yeah, I think some of those things you mentioned about perception relate back to the question we had earlier about these um, experiences being articulated in our literature and culture. And I, I really hope that uh, Dan and Jaya Prakash are, are part of the, the writers and creators of that uh, new perception that, that we, we will need to realize the, the you know, connection with these um, wild animals. I think, we have had an excellent uh, and diverse uh, panel. It's been a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn from each other. So many skills here in this panel, so many different perspectives. Uh, and I always remember uh, Dr. Sean Lam saying that he was an accidental scientist, just loving the outdoors and wanting to protect it. And it made sense to get to know it deeply and I think uh, that was definitely sort of my journey as well. I, I had no intention to set out to, to be a scientist, but just, you know, wanting to get it, to know it better and better and better uh, led to, to this path. Um, and empathy is, is super important. And on that note, Dan and Jaya Prakash recently released another short film, this time titled a little, a little differently called City in Nature. Um, and they ask if we have lost touch with nature. Dan and Jaya, could you tell us briefly, what was the motivation behind this new angle? Wow. Um, well, the response from our first video was tremendous, which kind of gave us some motivation that um, there are people who really care about nature based on the responses we, we got. So that kind of gave us a motivation to say, okay, let's do something a little more larger than what we did previously and maybe look at how things are iron wide. Uh, so yeah, that, that, was, that was our biggest motivation and uh, simply put, just want to help people fall in love with nature. I, I don't know how else to say that. I think um, that's the only way to do it because there has to be a cultural shift um, in the way people think across the board, across the population. Um, no matter how much um, the leadership does or designers and uh, scientists and everybody, whatever they do, bottom line is until uh, common man buys into that idea, uh, I think there's a lot of efforts, less results. So I think the proportions will change if there is a cultural shift in the way, like Sean said, way we connect with nature or you know how how um, people can relate to nature so uh, that's the intention behind these videos i don't know how successful we've been so far um but i'm very passionate about it and um, we'll keep trying dan share with us uh, your your um involvement in this project and i think you went through a little bit of what jaya prakash mentioned as well the cultural shift that happened to you <laughs> so tell us um what did this new film um uh, what was it? How how was it motivated? 
uh, I think oh, on my involvement on my part was that I was the director and editor. I helped bring the story and vision to life. And for me, I when I enjoy things, I feel for them, you know. So I want to translate that feeling that I feel. And it's a really special feeling when when you can finally reconnect with nature and at the same time reconnect with yourself. So I kind of want to translate that amazing feeling. It's like an emotion. You can't really explain it. Like most of everything that's beautiful in life, you feel it. You can't really see it, but you just feel that feeling. And I just want to bring that feeling into our film. So with music and everything and the right visuals, I want to help people start to get interested in all this wildlife so that they will care more for it. And yeah, I think that will that will really help people, you know, fall in love more and start to care for them. And that is definitely the first step to get people more engaged into becoming more aware for all these kind of things. And I think slowly everything will just build up. Like for me, I'm also just really starting out and building an interest just like both yourself and Sean. Like I accidentally kind of fall into this. Before this, I'm just an artist. I love like illustrating like fantasy and all that kind of stuff. So I just want to like help people reconnect as well, you know. Well, if it's anything, Dan, I mean, I think I'm the only one in the panel was was around when the first Star Wars came out in 1977. <laughs> and it was kind of a thing back then to see how many times can you go to the cinema and uh, watch Star Wars. And I had friends say 75, 80 times. It, it was kind of like City and Nature was that when I, well, I, I kept watching it. I kept hitting the replay button until I, th I think I got good <laughs> sleep, sleep uh, deprivation because it was so good and so gripping. But I, that's the start, you know, and then. I, you know, and then, and then, and then it's how do we, rather than work in our silos, I think you have the designers, you have the artists, the social scientists, the policy makers, the merchants, everybody, instead of kind of dealing with these issues separately, um, we start to say, hey, wait a minute, we can work together on, on this and, and, and make, you know, make our city greener and, and, and also transform, help transform other cities and work with people in other communities, you know, listen, what do the elders say? What, what do they have to say about this? And I, and I think, I think it's a great start. You know, I, I'm so inspired, Dan, you and Jai Prakash, two young guys, you know, and, and creating kind of a new language really for, for us to try to relate to um, something timeless like nature. Fantastic. Yeah, to follow up this uh, point uh, where I really appreciate this film that, I mean, this is, again, it's, uh, I'm also working as a landscape architect to visualize something about the wildlife, what's the kind of beauty of that too. So probably the, this film filmmaking also one of the gesture for the cue to care. So I call that the, this is like really, really needed that how we care about the, um, the wildlife. So probably there are many ways, multiple way, and uh, maybe more, more than that, it's really a lot of the way to showing the, our kind of cue to care about the, this uh, uh, wildlife. So through the, this education and through the research and through the other, other ma manner and all the things. So probably this is one, one way that we are trying to do it. And surely the, well, from, from my point is that it's a, like ecological approach to the new green space or a new way to design or so needed to mitigate this loss of the nature. So one of the very important point I want to also appreciate in the Singapore is that we are in really, really tropical, tropical city. So the tro tropicality is uh, really need to be more appreciated. So uh, well, person who came from the other country, I, I feel that it's, uh, this one is a little bit underappreciated now. So probably we can more fully utilize this, uh, how quickly uh, uh, grow all the biodiversity and how vibrant of the, all the this, even in the manicure green space, if we just let them grow a little bit. So how to mimic the, this uh, in the indigenous kind of tropical forest in terms of the structure or function and also the utilize all the this source as a part of our uh, uh, everyday life. I think this is, uh, somehow very good uh, ingredient what we already have it to cook. Yeah, so I, I, I hope that this is uh, happen in the more and more. So especially in the, this pandemic period that everyone is just say something about the, this. And I think it's uh, also be, very, uh, uh, suddenly it's very uh, become a part of our life to be a little bit more wild. So uh, probably this is good kind of moment that we can start pushing more toward this uh, ecological resilience. 
We still have lots of questions uh, coming in. We're gonna try and take one more from uh, Sharisa Chua, but the rest of you, if you have your questions and would like to share your thoughts, please continue to um, send them in through Twitter, Facebook, um, and we will try to respond outside of this session. Uh, Sharita Chua asks, continued, develop, continued development in Singapore is seemingly inevitable. In the same vein, what kinds of potential can everyday public spaces and or interactions in Singapore offer in fostering relationships between urbanites and nature. And I think uh, all of our panelists will have uh, something to contribute. Perhaps uh, Dr. Hamill, we'll start with you. Um, big question um, to be concise. I guess I, I will say that Singapore is very well known for planning, long-term planning uh, and, and really using science-based evidence. And, and I think there is really an opportunity uh, now to use biodiversity and conservation science information to, to really protect some of these key places. So these questions of uh, conservation versus development uh, can be resolved with, uh, they're not simple questions, but using a lot of this science on what is important to, to protect uh, for to support biodiversity can, can be used. So I think that would be my, my message, also bringing some international experience. Um, there's actually a, a really, well, it's becoming trendy to care about nature in cities uh, and, and Singapore is in a good position to say, we, we did it before it was cool in a sense and really showing this transformation uh, with uh, now a very biodiversity focused uh, and city in nature so really incorporating it to, to our culture. I'm gonna give uh, Yoon Hye an opportunity to respond to this because this is right up her alley I feel. So tell us uh, Yoon Hye, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so maybe I repeat again of the, this uh, uh, the uh, point that where the, it's it's a lot, a lot of good kind of initiative and planning comes and also many researchers, I can see that there are a lot of research about this uh, assessment of the our green space and uh, what, what we're having it. So uh, one of the lacking part is how to using that uh, data or science, uh, I mean, finding from the science to be applied to the, this uh, dear world uh, project. So that's kind of lacking part that what I also uh, pushing forward uh, as, as a landscape architect. So it's uh, again, it's a design is a kind of become a good tool to this uh, intensify the its ecological value in many, many way. So um, uh, so again, it's uh, how to make a public area to be more uh, uh, diversify or more connect with the, this nature. I think that's all mm -hmm. like uh, really responsible from the this uh, 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 like person who is in the front line in, in the this uh, all the implementation purpose. So I think that's uh, that's my role <laughs> anyway. It's an, and also responsible. I feel responsible of the, these things because I can see that it's a. Uh, uh, next transition, what we're going to having it is that I mean, this is coming from the uh, uh, cultural historian Thomas Berry to saying about the net, net next transition is that it's uh, from the scientific technology period to the ecological period. Like we are already in the ecological age. So I feel that it's uh, how to strengths of the, this all the information translate to the, this, uh, uh, the real world is uh, our, our role and our responsibility. Okay, obviously a very lively conversation, a lot more to talk than we have time for, but we have one minute to wrap up. I would like to ask everyone on this panel, how do you connect with nature? Very quickly, let's just run through this. Dr. Hamill, tell us, how do you connect with nature? Um, I'm gonna go for some outdoors yoga, uh, and I'm gonna use my last sentence also to thank Jaya Prakash and Dan for the amazing work because I'm, it will make my life easier as an instructor as well, using it in my courses. So really, really excellent work. So thank you for that. Dr. Lam, tell us, how do you connect with nature? I mean, of course, in some ways through the field work that I do, but really, I, I think when I wake up before I even open my eyes, I hear the birds calling bulbuls, magpie robins, and that tells me I made it through another night, another day of life to look forward to. 
and it's a, it's a, what, what a precious gift I've got for at least another 24 hours. So I think just for the moment I wake up, I, I, nature tells me I'm alive. Beautiful. Uh, Dan, tell us, how do you connect with nature? Uh, definitely lace up my shoes, get out there and breathe some fresh air and look around me and be present in the moment. Being present, Jaya Prakash, what about you? Well, for me, it's, it's just a spiritual thing. Uh, I'm just lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm out there for 4.30 in the morning pretty much every day. So it's, it's just me. Yeah. And Yunhe? Yeah, connect? it's uh, like uh, to observe them in the more uh, uh, like uh, different manner and also more like diverse manner that how, how we appreciate the uh, nature and also how we interconnect with the, uh, the, our life. So I think it's uh, something that uh, we, I'm, I'm really, really working on that in the research and in teaching and also in the, uh, my life too. So, yeah. And how about um, you, Debbie? How about you, Debbie? <laughs> oh, Sean, I was trying to wrap it up. So I wouldn't, I knew you were going to sneak one in there. Um, you know, last night I was uh, walking home from the bus stop and, you know, I live in an HDB area. So lots of buildings around me. I looked up and there was this amazing moon and the clouds just, uh, you know, filtering through the moon. And in that moment, it was just wonderful to be alive. I felt so happy um, and, and so much to, so much to celebrate. Um, I, I see a, I see a little, a little plant cracking out of the cement and I'm like, go plant. Those are my moments of uh, connecting with nature everywhere. Uh, and every time it's, uh, it's absolutely beautiful. So this wraps up. Thank you, Sean, for asking that question. Our discussion here, please keep the conversation going online. Tell us how do you connect with nature? Um, I'd like to thank our guests, Jai Prakash, Dan, Dr. Lam, um, Yunhei, and Dr. Hamel. Thank you all for sharing your wonderful hour with us. Don't go yet because we are going to close this session with a wonderful clip from Dan and Jaya Prakash's latest short film, City in Nature. I'm Debbie Ng at the Center of Nature-Based Solutions. I would like to thank my wonderful team that's sitting all around me for helping me put this together. See you all next time and goodbye. Fantasy merge into blurred lines. We lost touch with nature and its rhythm. Perhaps it's time to reconnect.